Today we have Gaurav Kirthi, Pete Cooper, and Lily Newman talking about global challenges and global approaches in cybersecurity policy. Let's give them a warm welcome. Thank you. Hmm. Oh, <laughs> booming voice. Uh, well, I'm so happy to see all of you here today. Uh, I'm Lily Hayne Newman. I'm a senior writer at Wired magazine. Um, and this is Global Challenges, Global Approaches in Cyber Policy. And I'm just going to introduce my other two panelists here. And then I'm going to let them talk a little bit about what they do, because I think if I give too much of a preamble, we'll just go straight into it. So, and I want to get a chance for you all to meet them. So, uh, Pete Cooper is the Deputy Director of Cyber Defense in the UK Cabinet Office, and he's to my immediate right. And then Gaurav Kirthi is the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore. So, Gaurav, maybe we can start with you. Tell us what you do. Um, thanks, Lee. So, hi, everyone. Um, my first time at DEF CON, super excited, uh, and super excited for the policy track. Um, quick self-introduction. So, I'm Gaurav. I I'm currently the Deputy Chief Executive of this organization called the Cybersecurity Agency of Singapore. It's a government agency. It straddles a number of roles. So we have an operational responsibility, Singapore's CERT, the uh, emergency response team comes under us. We also have a team that does development and infrastructure protection. So CISA's kind of roles comes under us. We also have an economic function. So we, in, we make sure that the talents are well trained for cybersecurity. We look at uh, developing industry uh, and the ecosystem around uh, cybersecurity. So it straddles a number of different agencies, uh, but it's all kind of squeezed into one, and I'm the deputy chief executive for that. Um, my personal background, I studied computer science way back in the 90s, uh, tripped and fell, became an Air Force pilot for 20 years, uh, loved it, and in the last part of my career, ended up doing this thing called network security, uh, which then led to cybersecurity, which is how I ended up here, um, and I love it. Specifically, my role in the organization is to bring tech and policy together. So I'm in charge of development. Uh, I have engineering teams that work for me. But a large part of what I end up doing is trying to translate the technical work, the technical challenges and the technical opportunities with emerging technology and the risks thereof into policy. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as we go along. But that's me. Pete, go for it. Um, so, hi, I'm Pete Cooper. So, I'm currently Deputy Director of uh, Cyber Defence within the UK Cabinet Office, uh, within the, 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 the organisation that looks after security for the whole of the UK government. So, I, I look over basically all of the government departments and, and sort of bits of the public sector and on everything from cyber operations, so how we respond to Log4j, for example, um, through to strategy, policy, red team standards, uh, assurance, and, and everything else uh, in, in between. Um, I'm also, um, I, was also, I also founded the, the Aerospace Village, so know the DEF CON community. And actually, my journey with DEF CON started back in um, DEF CON 08 in 2000. Anybody in the room at DEF CON 08 in 2000? Okay. No. Oh, I saw some hands. Oh, I saw some hands. Okay, so my previous life before I got into cyber was I was also a pilot, but enjoyed all the technology. And I was actually doing a flag up at Nellis, um, and DEF CON 08 rocked into the same hotel where we were staying. So, so for three days, I basically got drunk with all the hackers and going, this is amazing, and they want to talk about flying, and I want to talk about hacking, and then my, my DEF CON journey started. Um, so uh, it's just been a, sort of a fantastic sort of journey all the way through, um, uh, and then sort of, sort of getting involved with the village. Uh, but again, fantastic to be here talking about how we do this better and, and pull the community together either for policy, technology, and security. And Lily, before you continue, one random trivia fact which uh, you might not know. So previous, uh, the previous speaker, Mr. Chris Inglis, was also a pilot. Uh, so if you ever want to get into cyber policy, now you know the way to get in. And actually, I, I did say at the right start of this that, that whenever people talk about doing anything in cybersecurity, it always starts with a pilot study. So, so that's why you find so many pilots. That's my only joke, by the way. Earlier he said it was his worst joke. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, Thank you both, uh, and would love to hear more stories about DEF CON 8 at some point. Um, <laughs> in, you know, I, as we think about sort of the, the daily grind 
of information security, of defense. You know, this is network defense, institution defense, defense of individuals, you know, in cyberspace. Um, you know, you all out there are like very familiar and involved daily with that. And I, I'm wondering if we could start by just talking about how, how, this is a kind of big question, but how do we marry policy with that? And how do we uh, th approach policies that uh, resonate with that daily work? Should we go for it? Yeah, let's try. Um, so how do we do policy for cyber defense uh, broadly, I guess? Or sort of uh, policy that and aids and works together with, with that daily work, rather than sort of imposing something or making things harder. How do we make things right. easier? So I mean, it's an important question because I think part of the history of kind of cybersecurity agencies came from regulatory authorities, you know, audit inspection. And so there's always this fear that when a, when a cybersecurity agency thinks about technology, they think of it from an audit perspective, from a regulatory governance perspective. How do I clamp down on your great idea and make it as cumbersome as possible? Right. Uh, that is not ideal for everybody. Uh, like I said at the start, we also have an economic function in my agency, so I have to make that balance internally as well. I want to support innovation. I want to support emerging technologies. I want 5G. I want AI. I want all those cool, fun things that are happening outside. I just want them to be secure. And that's kind of a shared mission that we have at DEF CON as well. Like, we're excited by autonomous vehicles, we just want them to be secure. How do you marry it together? Part of it involves having conversations like this. Part of it involves having people with the technology, not just background, but passion coming into policy and people with the policy background coming into tech. Uh, we see that more and more, uh, and especially in smaller countries, uh, I'll use Singapore as the obvious example, we don't have the depth of talent to have multiple organizations focusing on different parts of the conversation. So we just kind of squash them all into one place. Uh, and what was actually a limitation now becomes an opportunity. You're too small to have 11 agencies looking at cyber. So that one agency now has that centralized focus and that trade-off inside. Uh, two quick points on that. The first is like, how do we do policy? It starts by recognizing that defending a country is not the same as defending an enterprise. A lot of CISOs come into, or we have conversations with CISOs, and they're like, well, I'm really good at defending a multinational corporation, a big enterprise. It's not the same. You don't control the assets. You don't control the network topology. You don't control anything, actually, as a country. You just inherit whatever's around you, and it's connected to whatever it's connected to, and you have to grapple with that. And you don't get to boss people around either. I can't disconnect my citizens. I have to deal with the citizens that I have. And as much as I love them to use strong passwords, if they don't want to, that is still a choice that they make. And so there's, there's a whole bunch of differences, and you have to understand the ecosystem, the people, the individuals, the technology well in order to do policy well. Yeah, I mean, I'd agree with that. I mean, the, um, you can have the best tech idea in the world, um, but if you want to roll out at scale, you can only do that if you marry it with amazing policy. Um, and, and that's where the, 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 there has got to be a good dialogue so that we can actually put the right things in place um, that, that roll out. Um, and, and on your point, is, I completely agree, is that enterprise scale change is different to sector scale change, which is what we look at from a government perspective. So if you're trying to change an entire sector, I mean, when you, when you sit in the center and you look around, and you think, well, the levers of change are amazing. It's like, they're really not. Um, they're really challenging because it's about behavior change. It's about helping make people do the right thing. Um, and that's one of the sort of mantras that we had um, in the cabinet office doing a lot of the change around, around the government, which was, if we build the right thing, it will, people will come. So if we have really poor policies, if we put really uh, poor standards out there, nobody's going to be interested, everyone's going to fight back, um, therefore what we put in place has to work for everybody. But the way that we get there is by having a really good diverse community of people feeding into it. So not just from the government space, but also from the hacker community, um, also from industry, and getting everyone to come in and talk about what good looks like. So we, can, so we can actually lift our head to the horizon instead of running when looking at our feet when it comes to technology. So for the development of the, of the UK government cyber strategy that we launched back in January, got signed off by the Prime Minister, we had a challenge panel that, that basically 
I brought a whole bunch of people in, including people from the hacker community, and um, I've never quite heard so, so many F-bombs on a call before from a, from a government call, but it was great to have the perspectives in there, and, and we ended up getting some really good dialogue because we broadened out those perspectives, because your, your worldview, your horizon, the more you can expand that by talking to amazing people and having amazing conversations, the better solutions you have, be they technical or policy. And, and actually, uh, so Singapore shamelessly copies from other countries because other countries do so much thinking, we just uh, don't want to reinvent the wheel. So uh, a lot of what UK has put into the thinking for their strategy, we'll look at it and we'll say, okay, a multi-stakeholder approach makes so much sense, we should do the same thing, US is doing the same thing. And, and I want to add one kind of dimension to it that has challenged government a little bit. Um, in most domains of governance, uh, you know, aviation, for example, government owns the airspace of the country. As a government, I can dictate what happens in the airspace, what flies, what doesn't fly, because I, we, we the government, own that airspace. In you know, the sand, the sea, whatever you want, to, all the natural domains, they existed before companies existed, and they will exist after companies long you know, cease to exist. That's not true for the internet. In the internet, the government doesn't own most things. Most of the infrastructure, most of the hardware, most of the software is owned by private companies. So it's unlike soil, it's unlike sea. The second part that's different is that uh, actually it's not even in your country. Uh, the infrastructure that you want to govern is international. That is the, the, that is the definition of the nature of the internet. And so when you want to govern it in your geographical boundary, the network topology of the internet doesn't fit neatly with that. So you have to unlock many of the traditional mental models that governments have had about, I am going to govern my geographical boundary, because you can't do that with the internet. You have to work with other people. And those other people are companies, they're hackers, they're other countries, and there's so much more depth in that conversation. Yeah, no, thank you for bringing that up, because I think it would be, I was going to say, you know, I. I I want to make this concrete a little more by asking you both to talk a little bit about maybe some examples of like triumphs or fails, you know, things that you learned from in policy uh, or things that, you know, are working really well. Pete, you're, you know, already started giving one example. Um, but I, I think it's, you know, great to frame it, uh, you know, in that way you were saying, Gaurav, of that. How, how do you how do you make the triumphs so that everyone is being served and everyone is able to kind of come together on that? So yeah, maybe give us some examples, just because this can all be very abstract. I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the I think one of the examples that I'm sort of most proud of that I did before I joined government was um, I got involved in how do we how do we make um, aviation aerospace um, a lot more secure? Um, and one of those questions that we got into was that the relationship between a lot of the aerospace industry type world and the, the researcher hacker community was actually quite an adversarial one. So that's one of the reasons that, that we built the village and start building bridges and communities and things like that. Um, but whenever, uh, for, for me, whenever I'm, I'm trying to look at how do we make things better, it's what's the biggest scale we can go to have the most impact because because we, we can sort of fiddle around at sort of lower levels, but the more that we can get impact and, and lay out what good looks like at a senior level, the better. So at one point I found myself on the keyboard um, uh, writing the, uh, so ICAO, which is like the UN body for aviation. Uh, and, and, and they were writing their first ever global aviation cybersecurity strategy. So think 193 different nations, signed off by the Secretary General, industry bodies and everything like that in there as well. And they wanted to get a view of what good looks like for states when it comes to aviation, aerospace, cybersecurity. Um, and I managed to get a line in there which was, um, states are encouraged to set up appropriate mechanisms for cooperation with good faith security research. Because we've got to start driving this top down at scale internationally to start normalizing the fact that if you're in your organization, you don't have all of the answers. You've got to be working collaboratively and positively with the security research and hacker community. So we managed to get that line in and get it signed off by a UN body, 193 different nations, and then start cascading out. So when these states are thinking about their strategies, they've got this in the forefront of their mind. But, but having the right people in the room when those sorts of discussions are happening, so the policies and strategies have the right people in the room to get these perspectives is really critical. And, and we can only really do that by building bridges, being really collaborative, and being really open with our conversations. Yeah, no, I love that. Uh, again, um, 
So the aviation industry is a much more mature industry when it comes to thinking about safety and security uh, because the consequences of not taking those seriously are pretty disastrous. Um, and the conversations that he mentioned at ICAO, which is that kind of UN body, are very similar to the conversations that we're having at the UN now as well. Um, so there is an open-ended working group that discusses the norms of responsible behavior on the internet. Uh, it has a long, complicated name, but roughly, you know, it's basically about cybersecurity. Uh, Singapore happens to chair it for this cycle, uh, and it's a fascinating conversation because you have 193 different countries. Some of these countries are just getting on the internet. They are trying to figure out what the internet is and what it means to them. Uh, some of these countries are extremely sophisticated, very advanced users of the internet. How do you define baseline norms of security? How do you encourage good behavior on the internet uh, for 193 vastly different countries? And so one of the successes and failures is that this is a really complicated process, made even more complicated by you know, current geopolitical realities, that uh, the world is not all uh, wonderful and peaceful. So that conversation is really difficult, but it's a really important one, because if you can get these lines in, if you can start shaping subtle behaviors on the ground at each country, at each region's level, you've got a huge opportunity to move forward. Uh, and so Singapore does sometimes put up ideas like, we have a massive government bug bounty program. Very proud of it. Um, it took a lot of effort from my colleagues over at the Government Technology Agency to get it through, because there's this natural aversion to like, well, if we're opening ourselves up to the hackers, you know, then it's terrible. We will find all these vulnerabilities. Like, it's better that the good guys find it before the bad guys find it. We all know that. Policymakers take some time to understand it. Um, I'm just going to give two examples of, I think, successes. Um, the first one is that uh, we had a huge challenge with passwords, and I think every country does. Uh, so what we did in a typical kind of civil servant response was we put up these billboards all over the country, like, use strong passwords, use long passwords, and like, we told everybody. And so when we did our surveys, everybody's like, yeah. Do you, we would ask them, do you know what a strong password looks like? And it was like 90% of it, like, yeah, we know what a good password looks like. like do you use them? Yeah. Sometimes I add an exclamation mark to the password one, two, three, if I really want to be very strong. And we had this problem every year. Like, people knew what a strong password was. They just refused to use it. Uh, eventually, we gave up. We decided, look, as a government, all of the government websites, we just won't use passwords anymore. We will just build a big-ass app that does national biometric authentication for the whole country and use that. So it's no longer use strong passwords, use long passwords. It's just like, look at your phone. That's it. Just look at your phone and we'll log you into your taxes, we'll log you into your, you know, your, your vehicle, we'll log you into your education records. Whatever you need to do, just look at your phone. And this solved so many of our problems because if we tackled the policy problem purely on a policy approach without thinking of the opportunities that technology could bring to the conversation, we'd keep banging our head against the wall like, oh, these users are terrible, they're all using weak passwords, they're all getting accounts compromised. But when you think about how technology can fix that, and there's, there's so much potential in there. Yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of things I want to jump off of from what both of you said, but first I'm thinking about, you know, you were both talking about incorporating different perspectives, regional perspectives, uh, uh, different uh, levels of digitization, or, you know, a, a, a state that is more, the population is more predominantly on mobile, or more, you know, like all these differences. Um, can you talk a little more about how, like, how do we get the right people in the right rooms? How do, how do we do the bridge building? Like, let's dive into that a little more. Um, it, it's hard. It's, it's, you've, you've sort of got to get the, the right person in the room first that says there needs to be way more people here. Mm -hmm. um, and this, this needs to be a much more sort of open discussion. I mean, you look at, I mean, some of the work that uh, Bo and Josh have done around I'm the Cavalry, and, like, creating amazing communities that talk about and sort of pushing on like medical device security right. and then bringing in companies to say look we need to talk about this and, and creating that safe space to go this is not going to be us uh, criticizing you uh, or this is this is about talking about these sort of honestly and realistically okay where are we in, in building the bridge but a lot of that will come down to getting the terminology right so that people have the right perspectives when they're going into that conversation I mean and you, you and I've, I've spoken about is that I, I have a real sort of love-hate relationship around the word hacker because I see it used so many times as a, as a term of bad. I mean, how many headlines do you say, hackers have done this? It's like, we don't turn around and look at the, the headline saying, all drivers cause crashes, all drivers are drunk drivers. 
why do, on earth do we let people talk around, sort of use the word hacker as a bad thing most of the time? So it's a, we've got to get the term, terminology right, and we've got to have the discussions framed in such a way that it's a positive one, not seen as a bad one, because then it starts breaking down the barriers a little bit more, um, and it turns into a, in, into a productive one where you can say to organizations, it's like the worldview you have isn't quite the worldview you think you have. Um, and actually here's some people here that can talk to you about what reality really looks like and what the adversary sees about your network. It can be as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we, we uh, live in an unusual neighborhood in, in ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. There are 10 countries. Uh, every different type of political system that you can think of, uh, we have that. Uh, every stage of economic development, we've got that. And each country actually has a different language. So we are a very diverse region. Uh, and yet, uh, we're also the only region to subscribe to the norms of responsible behavior from the UN. Uh, we're also the only region that has, for 17 years, run exercises across the countries, uh, cert to cert. Uh, and it has now become operationally a habit. If I see you know, Log4j uh, IOCs, I will immediately tell my cert to pick up the phone and call all of the other kind of regional certs and let them know this is what we're seeing. It takes 17 years. It takes regular practice. So despite all of the difference, it, it is possible to bring diverse countries together. But let me share a little bit about how and why that happens and how it works. You have to start by recognizing that countries are coming at the problem from a very different lens or a very different angle each time. Uh, you take Costa Rica as a perfect example. Uh, six months ago, I think they wouldn't be interested in cybersecurity. They wouldn't be in this room. They wouldn't be at all you know, part of the conversation. And to some extent, when we think about uh, talking about uh, cyber threats, the language that we use, and going back to terminology, the language that we used in the previous era of cybersecurity was state-sponsored threats. You know, big bad guys going after your country. And if you're Costa Rica, you're relatively harmless. No big bad guys are going after you, so you don't really care about cybersecurity. But ransomware isn't like that. Ransomware is just going after anybody, anybody who's willing to pay. And so in some perverse, ironic way, ransomware has actually democratized the conversation about cyber defenses, about protecting your country. Even more so because smaller countries have less depth. Um, a big country like US has, I don't know, 100 power grids, 100 different water stations, 100 for everything else. Singapore is tiny. We're like 40 kilometers by 20 kilometers. I don't have 100 power grids. I don't have the, the buffer and the redundancies to allow seven or eight of my power grids to get hacked. And so each station, each essential service becomes so much more critical. And that conversation for ransomware now, you put those two together, small countries take cybersecurity much more seriously in an incident. And understanding that, framing that for them, making them realize that Costa Rica wasn't targeted, it was just a target that changes the way that developing countries think about it because then they realize that they don't have a choice. You don't get to pick if you're a target uh, and you don't get to pick uh, how, when, why, where, but you have to be ready for it and you have to be prepared. And then they're a bit more receptive to having that conversation. Uh, so I think uh, you know, there are enough crises in the world. We should use them and, and, and bring those stories out to the countries that might not realize how important it is. Uh, use the right terminology, use the right language, and get them engaged in the conversation. Yeah, I think ransomware is a, you know, a great example recently you know, as something that has, in addition to spurring countries to rethink or you know, reconsider uh, some of their posture, it's also spurred a lot of uh, global col collaboration. Uh, law enforcement collaboration and, uh, you know, in cybersecurity and in policy. Um, but how do we reconcile, you know, Gaurav, you were giving some great examples about, like, the, the, the pros and cons in Singapore that, on the one hand, you know, you don't have all these massive landmass of interlocking power grids or, you know, the, these things to draw on, but on the other hand, there's a nimbleness that comes from that, uh, or, and you were talking about the depth, you know, not necessarily having the breadth and, you know, depth, but on the other hand, they're so concentrated and there's an ability to, uh, like, come together and act. Um, but that, right, there's both poles of that, obviously, and so how, how do we, uh, I, I either, I don't know, learn from both things or reconcile both things as everyone is trying to work together on some of these global issues. 
I mean, I'm not going to pretend that the, the experience or the lessons that Singapore has are, are always right. They may not be applicable for most countries. Uh, they work for us uh, sometimes, more than on occasion. Um, we're a small country, and that, as you pointed out, has its disadvantages. But one of the strengths of it is that we are a small country. Um, every country has bureaucracy. Uh, so, you know, government bureaucracy exists everywhere. Government bureaucracy uh, is proportionate to the scale of the country. Uh, the bigger the country, the bigger the bureaucracy, the more levels and layers and friction and red tape there is. Having a tiny country actually is an advantage. Uh, we don't have, you know, multiple cybersecurity agencies because we were too small to create multiple cybersecurity agencies. But that smallness now becomes an advantage. I don't need to deal with that, that friction that comes with dealing with multiple layers. And that allows us to move a little bit more quickly, a little bit more nimbly. In some senses, we like to try to be the world's policy lab. Uh, you know, if you guys have a great idea for a good policy, and we regularly do this from UK and US, they have a great idea in the strategy, we're like, we'll do that. And we do. And then because we're small enough to pull it off, we sometimes get it through a little bit earlier, a little bit faster. Uh, we don't claim credit for the idea because many of the best ideas came from that conversation across different countries, different organizations. But we do have the ability to implement faster. And that implementation sometimes gives us great lessons which we then share back. Sometimes the policy ideas work out. Uh, sometimes they're a catastrophic failure and then we just pivot. We have a cybersecurity act, it's uh, four years old. And we're reviewing it already because we realized that, oh, wait, we forgot the cloud. Huh. <laughs> we should put that in there somewhere. And, and now we're thinking, like, how, how do you put cloud into a cybersecurity act? So we look around at what's Australia doing, what's UK doing, what's US doing. So all of this stuff, like, allows us to, to experiment a little bit faster. I, I would like to talk about one other specific thing that we did, which is the labeling scheme. Uh, which, again, was uh, a very bright idea from the UK, which was talking about principles for IoT devices, you know. What are the principles of security that you'd want or expect to have in an IoT device? We took that basic idea and we said, look, I need to change two types of behavior. The first type of behavior is consumer behavior. Today, people are buying baby cameras because they're cheap and they're looking for the cheapest possible baby camera they can find. Nobody cares about security because they don't know what it is. The second type of behavior we wanted to change was manufacturers. Manufacturers are building the cheapest kind of baby cameras they can build because Consumers aren't demanding for anything more. So we realized that if we were to put a sticker on the side of the box with the one, two, three, or four star rating, no one knows what the rating is. The cybersecurity agency of Singapore just kind of magically does it. We have a system for it, but we just put that sticker on the side of the box and suddenly now there's a premium device that's a four star baby camera. And parents are like, oh, well, I want to buy the four star baby camera for my princess because you know I don't want her pictures to end up on the dark web. And they're prepared to pay five bucks more, four bucks more. Once a consumer is prepared to pay five dollars more for a four-star rated baby camera, guess what the manufacturers do? Like, we should build more four-star devices because you can get a bit more money from the consumers just by not having a default password. And so all of this kind of behavioral nudges, again, the UK has an entire nudge unit that thinks about nudging consumer and manufacturer behavior. We just put it into practice and launch the policy. So we're, we're kind of the, the world's policy lab. We'd love to have more ideas from DEF CON's policy group if you have any. Uh, we're happy to try them out and see if they work. And if they don't, we'll also give you feedback. <laughs> Peter, I want to turn to you, but I, I like the idea of having like the nudge agency. <laughs> that it's like a series of nudges towards getting, you know, all of this where it needs to go. Anyway, go ahead. Well, I mean, but, but that does touch on it because this is about people. Right. So we, we, we're all here because we love tech, but we're also here because it's an amazing community. Um, so this is about the, if we're talking about people and diversity across multiple organizations, really that's about building trust. So how do we start building trust across those diverse communities so we can have productive, proactive conversations instead of transactional, reactive conversations when bad happens? Um, and it takes a long time to build up trust, especially if, I mean, some, some, of, the, some of the most challenging collaborations I've, I've sort of worked on are where the two parties are a long way apart right at the very start. And it's hard work to get people in the room. And it's hard work to start bringing people closer together and build trust to the point where they can actually talk to each other. But because, 
because they are so diverse, when they get to the point of being able to talk to each other and trust each other, the value of that partnership is huge because they, they are now speaking from completely different perspectives, but are able to talk, they're able to learn from each other, they're able to collaborate. And, and one of the things that you'll see a lot of the work across both the international community, both government and also private sector, is large-scale ad adver uh, adversaries. Uh, you see what's happening in Ukraine at the moment. The international community galvanizing public and private to help give um, as much support as possible and, and innovation. Uh, th that activity has been fantastic. It's been coming for a long time with the conversations that have been happening up, up to that point. But the more and more that we, we actually have the exercises where we collaborate, we have policies that have some semblance of parity across different organizations, um, the, the better place we're, we're going to be in the future. And part of the challenge, and going back to your, place, your, your point about the cloud, it's we all talk about getting to this utopian vision in the future where we've solved everything. Uh, we're, not, we're not getting there. Because whenever you think in the policy world of, hey, we'll get to this point, we'll plant a flag, and it'll be great, and that'll be the, that's what we're aiming for. The world changes, the adversaries change, and now we've got to plant a new flag. So it's a continual evolution. The quicker and better we can do this evolution, collaboratively across all the, all the different stakeholders, the better we are and the, and the quicker we get to that good position to reduce the risk to our countries, to reduce the risk to all of our stakeholders, and build this all global commons. So I think we would like to take some questions. We'd really love to hear what you all are thinking and what you'd like to know from Pete and Gorov. I do not think there are mics. So you might need to, oh, I think I see a mic off in the distance coming towards us. We have, we have, a, <laughs> we have, a, we have a dancing goon with two mics. <laughs> um, yeah, so OK. Find a mic uh, if you want to ask a question. I see some hands. Um, thank you very much for a very insightful session. Um, I particularly enjoyed the the global aspect. Um, so uh, with the last portion of your conversation about the ever-changing landscape and the challenges of you know, changing the policy ongoing because it's not a kind of one-time set, um, how, what type of techniques did you use to make that communication effective? Because every time you're going to change direction, every time you're going to have to implement a new policy, um, it's wonderful to write it up and put it together, but how do you get it out there, right, in, in time so people could actually have, or whether it was private sector or the public sector, be able to act on it and, and use it as a guidance? Um, yeah, I mean, I, so I think just to, um, slightly difficult here, but I think, I, I think the best way to answer it is that um, if you're making incremental change, um, you, you're putting the flag slightly further ahead of where everyone is at the moment. And, and then, yeah, okay, well, well, we've got a good likelihood of getting there, but it's a small change. We know we're going to have to come back to this. And there's a massive decision to make about right, how far ahead do you put the flag? How, how visionary are we going to be here? The further ahead you plant it, it's a proper long-term vision. It's got to be a big change. It's going to make a massive difference. So, um, so to give an example, the, the cyber strategy we pushed out in January, um, that's, got a, that's got a timeline out to 2030. Because what we're looking at is long-term change to actually get all of the key foundational pieces that we need at scale. Because as soon as you bring out huge scale with the policy, it's like, so we're trying to do this huge amount of work in breadth and depth um, across a huge amount of organizations, and it's gonna be a massive change for them. Okay, we, we've just got to accept this is gonna take a long time. And, and the way that, that I always think about trying to get that policy to work is make sure it's not shit. If it's a good policy and people want to do it because it's common sense, they're going to come to you and say, I really want to do this. So, um, so we, we, for example, we're looking at how we do assurance at scale across the whole of like, the, the government. So we've come up with what we think is an assurance process that will make life easier for people and give us much better data for both organizations, departments, and also at sector scale. 
And now we've got organisations within other organisations across campus say, we really want to get involved in this. Can we do a pilot? Can we get in? So it's, so it's build good stuff and then the policy's way easier. But you're only going to do that if you have great dialogue beforehand. Can I add two points? Uh, the first is uh, it sometimes requires you to have philosophical clarity about what the principles are. So for example, in Singapore, we treat access to secure, trusted internet as a public utility, like drinking water. That is a big difference from treating it as a private service, which means that every average individual who lives in a you know, rented flat deserves to have secure internet, regardless of whether they can afford a firewall or antivirus or everything else. That is a principle, and that changes how your policies then evolve over time. The second is, uh, and I want to echo Pete, the, the conversation cannot be a post-implementation conversation. It cannot be like, oh, this is the, the new regulation, the new policy, now I will communicate it to you. As you're designing it, you should be having those conversations with the companies, with the stakeholders, so that by the time it goes public, they already were like, yeah, we were involved with like 90% of this, the wording's a little bit different, but that's fine, we roughly know where it came from. Uh, and if you're doing it only at the end, it's too late. So I mean, and so on that, it's, it's um, if, if you're imposing a policy on people, it's not going to work unless, unless it's really simple. Yeah. So the more that they can collaborate and be involved and feel a stakeholder in it, it's way easier. Um, and, and I mean, to give it one of the examples is, uh, one of the other things is that sometimes a bit of vagueness helps, especially in the long term. So, so on the strategy that we've got, we've got two pillars. One is really good sort of resilience. So that's, we all know that's a really good thing. We can get into the detail of what resilience looks like. And the other one is Defenders One. So how do we better bring all of these different stakeholder organizations, all these departments, industry, every, how do we bring everyone together so we better Defenders One? So if we're defending in stovepipes, we will fail because adversaries don't attack in stovepipes. If we try and defend them, we're going to fall over. So how do we defend as one? And, and people sort of kept on asking me, well, well can, you, can you scope defend as one? Give me a list of what defend as one looks like. And it's like, well, no, because I want people to start using this within their organizations, within their teams. How do we better defend as one within our team? How do we better defend as one within our department? And then if I'm having a conversation with industry, it's like, okay, so how do we better defend as one together? Because we're all on the same platforms. So, so trying to get that sort of vision and that, and that culture and that ethos of, right, we're in this together and working together can be a really nice way of helping people come on that policy journey. The English have an unfair advantage because they invented English, so communication is their strength, unfortunately, so we not, do uh, not learn all a lot the time. from them. <laughs> not all the time. <laughs> so there's one more. Yeah, another question. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on how do you scale information sharing between in particular between national governments. I mean, Grab, you mentioned having, you know, picking up the phone and saying, hey, sir, share this Log4j information with these other countries. Like, oh, that, that doesn't scale, right? Traditional government methods of information sharing, especially in intelligence, don't scale very well, and they don't, they don't move at the speed it is required. ISACs sort of sometimes work, sometimes they're something that companies can throw on their website. So like, do you have examples, have you guys seen examples of information sharing arrangements that scale at speed and you say that works, that's working better there than these others, and what's the secret sauce? I'm going to give you an answer that you're probably not going to like. Um, and the answer is that it takes hard work and there is no shortcut. Uh, confidence building uh, is incredibly difficult because it takes time. Uh, so even within our region, getting uh, Vietnam, Philippines, uh, Indonesia, Singapore to come to a point where we're prepared to exercise together, discuss our operational processes with each other, uh, that takes decades. Uh, and you can't just kind of shortcut that. Unfortunately, information sharing arrangements will always exist as a function of the level of trust that you have in the other party. I if you don't trust them, you just won't. And no matter what policies you put in place, no matter what structures and processes you put in place, it will fail because the trust isn't there. And if the trust is there to start with, then actually you can layer on processes informally and they work. So even within ASEAN, I, we have processes. I wouldn't say that they're super formal. Uh, it's not the nature of our region to be super formal about the processes. Uh, Chris knows this very well. Um, but it is there because we trust each other. 
uh, to, to and, and to reiterate the point that takes time. Um, all of the things that you mentioned about Isaac's and Sirs, they're all the right they're all the right components of the answer, but you have to start small and slowly build up. Um, and and I'll, I'll give a, a slightly different slant on that. I mean, we've all got communities around the, the uh, around. Uh, or contacts and, and people we know and trust in different sort of either countries or, or different organizations. And whenever something kicks off, you can generally pick up the phone and speak to a friend and go, what's going on? We've got any really good information. So that's information sharing, but point to point. And, and we've got quite a lot of that across different sort of uh, people and friends and things like that. But when you talk about institutional sh information sharing, formal information sharing, the first people are going to get involved are lawyers. Um, so therefore, when's the last time that we had a lawyer sort of like really coming in to talk about policy and things like that? So it's, sort of, it's you're having to diversify who's in that conversation, how do we share information properly and what does that look like? Um, and, and I also, I, if, if we look and I'll go right back to what's going on in Ukraine at the moment, the information sharing that's flying around uh, with all of the stuff that's going on in Ukraine, I mean, there's been some fantastic presentations both here and at, and at Black Hat about here's what we did through open source, here's what we crowdsourced. Here's what we did, and we published straight away as soon as we saw it to make sure that people have got the right information, and we can verify it and actually then use it and work on it together, be it across the ISACs or across the certs, and, and actually collaborate for good by using that information. Because we've got to share the information in a way that is actionable, reduces risk, reduces harm. There are ways to do that through the, the, the crowdsourcing side of it but it's also the signal from noise challenge. So you can do that signal from noise when you've got a friend and go, you really need to know this. So on the one hand, we've got that and we want to scale it. And then you go to internet scale, and a whole bunch of stuff going off. There's so much noise. How do you then distill that down? And that goes back to your point of the more that you have exercised with them in the past, the more that you've done stuff like this in the past. I mean, look, all of the new connections that have sprung up because of what's been happening in Ukraine and all of those collaborations means that if anything else of that scale happens again, they exist already. So, so it's part of the, I, I don't, there is never a, a good answer apart from just sort of galvanizing and, and getting behind something that, that you sort of see the need and you'll, you'll see the, an, an amazing amount of blockers in place for really good information security sharing until something happens and all of a sudden they magically disappear. Um, we need to get to the point where we can disappear them way earlier because we can articulate the need. There, there's a whole conversation buried inside that about liabilities and responsibilities that we could have another two hour conversation on because there are huge corporate challenges in sharing information for good reason, which is why the lawyers are the first ones to come out sometimes, which deserve to be unpacked. And I think it'll take years for us to unpack them, but those are important conversations for us to have as well. But like you said, in a crisis, fortunately, many of the companies know that they have to do the right thing. And so those impediments do kind of step away. I wanted to take one more question, but just watching the time, I think instead I'm just gonna ask you to, you know, we brought up, uh, the, the word resilience, and both of you mentioned it, and I, I just was wondering if each of you could talk a little bit about, we talked about the word scale, you know, that that's the real purpose and the goal in all of this, right, is to develop policies that promote resilience. And I, I just wonder if either of you have thoughts from our conversation today or, you know, uh, from your work about, is that always what needs to be driving these conversations, and do you think it is right now? Is that what's in everyone's minds? I think it's in both of your minds. Yeah, I, I could try. Um, so the morning speaker, uh, Chris Inglis, used the word confidence rather than resilience. Um, I like that word. Um, the one that, and it, the reason why that word drives me is because confidence in technology, confidence in digitalization, in progress is not a given. Uh, humans have invented and uninvented technologies when they lost confidence in it. Uh, I flew here from Singapore. It is a 20-something hour flight. Uh, it is a long flight. Uh, in the 1980s, we invented the Concorde. We invented supersonic travel as a human species. And then we couldn't find a way to make it safe. We lost confidence in it. And we uninvented supersonic travel. So now I have to fly 20 hours. It could have been a three-hour flight. We have the capacity to uninvent really useful things if we can't find a way to make it safe and secure. If we can't find a way to give people confidence and trust, if autonomous vehicles come out on the streets and end up killing a whole bunch of families every week, you're not gonna buy an autonomous vehicle. 
autonomous vehicles are going to disappear from the market. So the idea of giving people confidence in technology is what drives us. And all of the vulnerabilities that we find, all of the risks, the issues, the threats that we see in emerging technologies, we want to address them as early as possible so that people can grow up having faith, having confidence, having trust that technology is here for good. There are parts of it that have challenges, but it's here for good and we should embrace it securely. So that's kind of what drives us. Well, you have something quick, Pete? Well, I was just going to say, so for me, resilience is about people. Yeah. So we talk about technology and resilience and all that sort of stuff, but look how many people are actually really tired post the last two years that we've had. And, and we need more people in to uh, the sector from lots of different uh, areas. Uh, and that's why I think like DEF CON are fantastic because we are hopefully inspiring more people to get really excited with playing with the villages and things like that. That's the thing that gives us resilience. Technology will always give us challenge and vulnerability. It's the people that give us the resilience. Um, and I think we've always got to, we've got to keep an eye on that because I'd much rather take um, an amazing team rather than amazing technology. The team will find a way. The team will give you resilience. We, we, we almost hang off the two technology way too much. Yeah, well, I think that's a great place to end. Thank you both so much for doing this. And if there's one thing I learned today, it's make sure your policy is not shit. Fair. <laughs> Thank you.